first-degree murder defense, and the mandatory sentence was life if convicted. To give these kids any hope of a decent life at some point in the future, the plea was their best bet. Catherine and Curtis would accept the deals and plead guilty to second-degree murder on August 6, 1999, and begin 18-year prison sentences in adult prisons as a 13- and a 12-year-old. Florida State University College of Law professor Paolo Anino worked diligently in favor of legislation, which could have resulted in clemency for the kids. It came close to passing, but it never did. Curtis Jones' single disciplinary infraction was a 24-hour-long escape following damage to the fence at his facility after a hurricane in 2008. This added 318 days to his sentence. He would grow up to become an ordained minister while incarcerated and would be released from South Bay Correctional Institution on July 28, 2015, with a lifetime probation requirement. He has never given an interview or spoken to the press. Catherine Jones became pen pals with an active duty sailor in the Navy in 2009 after he wrote to her after reading the investigative journalism piece. They eventually married in 2013, and he planned to retire when she was released from prison. She was released from Lowell Correctional Institution in Ocala, Florida, on August 1, 2015, at the age of 30. In an interview from her new home in Kansas in late November of the same year, she reported that she was already actively involved with the justice organization's ICANN, Incarcerated Children Advocacy Network, as well as CFSY, the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, just 100 days after her release. She reported that the marriage to her pen pal had not worked out, but that she was looking forward to that Thanksgiving of 2015 to see her father and brother for the first time since her release. Although they have not spoken with or been apologized to by Catherine or Curtis, Sonia Nicole Spate's daughters had quite a bit to say about their mother's murder in 2015. Her oldest daughter, who was nine when her mother was killed, recently graduated from the University of Alabama, knowing her mother would be proud as she was a huge proponent of education. She keeps her mother's memory alive by releasing balloons on her birthday with her own two children, who never got to meet their grandmother. Sonia's younger daughter, who was eight, often listens to her mother's favorite music and visits her grave often. Of course, they have thoughts about how they wish the past had gone. They acknowledge the allegations of abuse, but ponder why their mother had to die, when it's unclear what, if any, part she played in the abuse scenario of Catherine and Curtis Jones. Her oldest daughter wishes that the Department of Family Services has done more to help the kids and that they would have considered leaving them motherless, but expresses that, although she has not seen them show any remorse for taking their mother's life, her faith has allowed her to forgive. And now for a word from some of my favorite podcasts. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. Hey guys, do you like mysteries and urban legends? Do you like creepy stories and unsolved true crime? Then join us every Tuesday and Saturday at Mysteries and Urban Legends and get to the bottom of weird urban legends and spooky mysteries. Hey y'all, Jen and Lindsay here from Corpus Delicti Podcast, here to tell you to check out our show. If true crime is your thing, it's ours too. 
with a touch of lightheartedness and a dash of Southern charm. We cover compelling cases and crack them open for you. Serial killers, hitmen, historical hallmarks. We've got it all and bring you new episodes every Tuesday morning. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and most other podcast apps. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter too. That's C-O-R-P-U-S-D-E-L-I-C-T-I. See you Tuesday. Part 2. John Engel. At the impressionable and formative age of two years old, John Engel was adopted from the Philippines by Tom and Mary Elizabeth Reinschmidt Engel, joining a four-year-old sister who had come to their Colorado family in the same fashion. John and his sister Grace had escaped unbelievably abusive situations when they were essentially rescued by the Engels. Mary was a talented musician who taught music at John's middle school for a time, gave private piano, violin, and flute lessons, sang at church, and was a member of the orchestra in Boulder, Colorado. Tom could be found working on the IBM supercomputer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Grace enjoyed the flute, while John was considered one of the most talented pupils Mary ever taught piano to, even at the age of three. Neighbors would later recall the sounds of him playing filling the neighborhood when everyone had their windows open. Even though this family appeared to be off to a successful beginning, by the time John was 14 in 1999, his 16-year-old sister Grace would be living out of state, receiving psychiatric treatment after trying to stab their mother Mary in the summer of 1997. During the first semester of the 1999-2000 school year, it is reported that as an 8th grader at Twin Peaks Charter Academy, John began to have a full-blown infatuation with one of his teachers, to the point that he would record their conversations to listen to later. She would betray his trust in his opinion by alerting the administration and his parents to some dark and disturbing writings he had submitted. John's assignments began to include depictions of violence and self-harm, and a classmate reported that John repeatedly spoke of suicide that semester. This classmate even stated that John had mentioned that he would have to kill his entire family before committing suicide because he couldn't bear to leave them grief-stricken. His parents knew that their son was suffering from an emotional disturbance and were beginning to take action. But given the situation with their daughter, they were very reluctant to go to such extreme lengths with their other child. On the morning of December 11, 1999, Mary and Tom would go jogging, leaving John at home with Mary's mom, Catherine Reinschmidt, who was visiting from Austin, Texas. Mary would arrive back at the house first, only to be chased down by her son and stabbed to death. There was no way she did not see her elderly mother on the kitchen floor, having already been hit with a hammer. Blood evidence would show that Mary made a brave attempt to run for her life, but was eventually overpowered by her son. Within a few minutes of the attack, Tom Engel returned after completing his run. Once he was inside the garage, John immediately attacked him from behind. He was struck in the back of the head by the hammer, and John attempted to stab him before Tom was able to disarm his 14-year-old completely. Eighth grader John Engel was arrested and charged as an adult with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder, along with aggravated assault. Investigators would find a list of 11 names, all his intended victims, including himself. He would spend the weeks following his arrest on suicide watch in a mental health facility, and it would take months to determine his mental competency. He was being represented by Carrie Lackland, public defender, and would plead not guilty by reason of insanity. John would ultimately accept a plea deal that required him to serve seven years with the Division of Youth Corrections for Mary's killing, followed by 32 years for killing his grandmother, to begin at age 21 and be carried out in adult prison. At the end of his juvenile sentence, his plea allowed for John to petition the court to reconsider the adult prison portion of his sentence, and in October of 2007, he does just that, requesting a hearing for either a reduced jail sentence or a community-based correctional sentence. 
Carrie Lacklin had the opportunity to present evidence favorable to John Engel in front of a judge in hopes of a reduction to his looming 32-year sentence. Even the Boulder County District Attorney at the time was in favor of some type of early release for John. Over the course of the nine-hour hearing, the Engel family's concerns over John's continuing danger to the community were heard, and Carrie Lacklin presented evidence and expert testimony attesting to the fact that John Engel, now 21, committed the murders during a time of uncontrolled bipolar disorder so severe that he was certain he was under the influence of Satan. Once in custody, he was placed on the proper medications and therapy schedule to get his illness under control around 2000 to 2001. Public defender Lacklin pretty much said that John Engel would be released from prison someday, whether it be in 32 years or sooner, based on this hearing. His argument was that John's severe mental illness would not be treated in prison and society would be better off receiving a medicated, well-monitored version of John as compared to an institutionalized 50-something-year-old whose bipolar disorder had pretty much gone unchecked for the previous three decades. The adult prison system simply did not have the resources to keep John Engel mentally stable, but would have to release him eventually regardless. In early April of 2007, the Boulder County Board of Community Corrections voted to supply the funds necessary for John Engel to be housed elsewhere, and District Court Judge Carol Glowinski would go on to determine that the 32-year sentence could be served out in the community, beginning at a halfway house, with GPS monitoring by ankle bracelet, followed by intensive supervision and lifetime probation. Judge Glowinski stated, It is such a temptation to just do what the victims want because I want to relieve their suffering, but that's not my job. I just really, deeply, respectfully disagree with their view of this case regarding the family's disagreement with John's release. His father and surviving victim, Tom Engel, said that he was afraid for his life and that, I love him, but I detest what he did. I don't trust my son. He has demonstrated he can deceive everyone around him while planning to act out anger at an opportune time. In 2004, while John was already properly medicated and in the company of his psychiatric team, He met with his father, Tom, for the first time since the murders took place. The pair had been writing letters back and forth for some time before they took this step, and Tom thought for sure that John was ready to go forward with healing and the steps toward reconciliation within his family. But the meeting was tense, and John was combative from the get-go. His father said that he didn't express any sorrow for his actions— only in terms of how his own life was affected. He mentioned that the intended victims on his confiscated kill list deserved what he was going to give them, including the middle school teacher who expressed concern over his writings. He told his father that they were stupid for adopting him. Tom would bring this up during the 2007 proceedings, to which the judge would determine that he simply wasn't emotionally ready for the meeting at that time. John Engel spoke too. How do you say you're sorry? All I know is that I'm sorry and that I will spend the rest of my life trying to make amends. I believe justice is more than a location. It's learning to live with the shame. I'm a stronger and better person because of what I've learned over the past eight years. Regardless of today's decision, I will continue to grow. He said his goals on the outside were going to school, studying math and music, and perhaps time spent somewhere working in the justice system to aid incarcerated juveniles. His sister, two years older, said that her mother and grandmother deserved better. I feel this is so unjust, she said, and I will be looking behind my back every day. So in July of 2008, a now 22-year-old John Engel moved into his new residence at the halfway house, 
following a 60-day transitional 